Thanks for the invitation, uh, Sasa, uh, Suzanne, Gianreto, Lucia, and uh, Giacomo. I'm going to be presenting some work I did in, in Imperial College with um, Christopher Jackson. And some of the things that you're going to see uh, have been done by Gino de Helder, who is now a postdoc in East Derry. I guess my title already gives away uh, my main result. So I'm going to start by the end. Um, and this is, uh, well, the Suez Reef. It's normally considered a failed rift. Well, normally it is considered a failed rift, and failed rifts are generally considered as technically inactive. But with uh, evidence uh, from um, digital elevation models, uh, we see uh, tectonic activity after the reef is uh, abandoned and actually ongoing uh, till present. So the simplest of uh, context, uh, so we can ubicate ourselves, uh, um, the reef, uh, the sweat reef open in oligomyosin times as the propagating edge of the Red Sea is spreading rich. And then when the Dead Sea uh, fault uh, initiated activity and assumed the motion between Arabia and Nubia, then it is when uh, the reef is said to have failed. Um, Greece was uh, perhaps against this general consensus already and suspected that there was some activity. He has been working thus in his PhD, if I'm correct have seen many of seismics, and some of them seem to indicate to him that the activity continued today. So when I was there, uh, he, we thought it was a good idea to check uh, for with my skill set, say topography, river profiles, and nick points, and marine terraces, whether this was the case and there was some activity there. I'm going to have to disappoint Sasha here. He was talking about deep time, and I'm afraid this is not about deep time at all. But, uh, well, anyway, um, so this evolution that I mentioned before, it is uh, shown in the, in the geology of the area, of course. And I was very happy when I found a couple of maps by Mustafa Adel. He has been working there like for more than 30 years. This is really the geologist of the area. And he has recently put um, a chapter just, just when I arrived uh, for, for this project. And in this map, what you see here is, uh, um, the area divided in units of, um, with regards to the rifting. So you have the Precambrian basement, you have the pre and sea reef sediments in blue, and then you have what he mentions as post Miocene sediments. So this is the post rifting phase. As, uh, as you can see, uh, there are some faults between the uh, Sin reef sediments and the past reef sediments, but also, and these are new ones, uh, I've mapped some faults in the, in the past reef sediments. If we look for the geology, so a bit more specific, and again, this is a, a, a map that Mustafa put forward, I just improved it a tiny bit using the topographic contrast, so the slope between the units to just be slightly more accurate, but it was already a very, very good map. Um, well, you can see these um, bounding faults that separate uh, the non-rifted areas from the rifted area, and then you can see some other faults that are inquiry faults. Um, so again, uh, the first finding is this uh, normal faulting in a unit that is uh, pleoquaternary and is sandstones and evaporitic plastics. So um, these faults uh, a priori um, do not really fit uh, that the area was not active in very recent times. Of course, this is a map view. You just have to believe what I'm saying, but let's go into the approaches so you don't have to believe anymore. Um, here, I pick up uh, one piece of that region that is a uh, pleoquaternary, and I apply what I call uh, stack swaths. These uh, are basically um, several hundreds of swaths with a very narrow width that lie parallel to each other, and then they are stacked perpendicular to the trend. 
and they provide these sort of uh, two and a half uh, um, two and a half D views of a terrain. So what you see in here is that piece of terrain. And if you were on the sea of Suez and you were looking inwards, then this is a topography that you would uh, be able to see if you were to have a very wide view. Uh, everything that is in blue and preserves the same tones are simply uh, swaps that progress and normally with respect to each other, the only difference is the space that there's between them. But when you have um, these white spaces, those are indicating uh, changes in the slope. Now, the interesting part is behind basically each one of those changes in slope, what we see in the topography is uh, triangles. We see triangular, uh, triangular facets. We see these triangular morphologies. So for me, this is uh, very clear evidence of, uh, of active faulting in, in this, uh, in this pre-quaternary unit. Um, I forgot to mention this is extremely exaggerated in the vertical and this covers 60 kilometers in the horizontal. Uh, now, if we go for another approach that would be rivers or more specifically river profiles, and why are river profiles useful to know tectonic activity? Basically because the channel steepness of the rivers can be used as a proxy for relative uplift rate of erosion. This means that if you have a river profile that is roughly in equilibrium between uplift and erosion, you would have what we call like a steady state. And once you apply some regional uplift to it, then uh, the river develops these uh, neat points that separate uh, downwards, uh, downstream sectors of the rivers that have already catch up with the new conditions of uplift and upward sectors of the rivers that are unaware that this is happening. Um, uh, so these are very clear indications of, um, well, uh, tectonic activity and could be also sea level, sea level drop, so base level drop. Um, at the end, you have a final steady state that uh, indicates a new equilibrium or equilibrium with the new conditions of happening. So, well, this is a very loaded uh, slide. I'm going to skip most of it. Um, these are analysis on all the rivers or major rivers in both uh, uh, reef shoulders. Uh, both the uh, normalized steep index uh, is these, and these are the drainages and the nick points. So, I'm going to just following along the lines of what I just mentioned, I'm going to show this one over here that is running through uh, this Plio quaternary unit and only through that unit. There's no tectonic uh, contact, there's no lithologic contact, it's all within this unit. And still it has this uh, uh, profile that looks uh, quite out of equilibrium in general, but also has the tectonic nick point uh, indicating some sort of tectonic activity in very recent times. This tectonic activity has to happen in old hanging walls, new foot walls, um, because of where this uh, river is uh, specifically located. And then again, uh, well, the third approach is marine terraces, and well, marine terraces are paleo platforms that have a paleo sea cliff in the back. And between these two elements, uh, we have what we call the paleo shoreline angle. This paleo shoreline angle is relevant because it indicates the position of past coasts where you have uplift of the rains. So when you have that uplift of the rains in coasts, you develop this uh, morphology, this staircase type of morphology. And because we generally know and this, because this develops in relation with climatic cycles and sea levels ups and downs. And we generally know when those uh, platforms are most commonly being abandoned. This is at sea level high stands. Then we can also date both relatively and absolutely the age of those uh, surfaces. So um, we did uh, um, compilation of marine terraces that we found in the area. I've never been there, so it was again a compilation from previous previous studies. 
And what you can see is that, well, you have them all around the reef. And what this becomes a bit more interesting uh, when you check uh, how fast this uh, uh, terrain could have been moved up as recorded by these marine terraces. And we see rates up to 0 0.25 millimeters a year. And also it is uh, interesting in terms of what are the shapes that those marine terraces uh, have, which uh, really seem to relate with uh, normal faults. Um, uh, so what you see here is a displacement profile uh, in those uh, marine terraces, in this case, the youngest set of marine terraces, MIS 5E. And, and this take place here in the football of, uh, of that uh, fault system. Uh, this is also interesting because these marine terraces have been previously attributed to some regional effects. So some magmatic intrusion in relation with the Afar plume. Uh, but if you were to have that, you would expect a decaying pattern uh, northwards, which we don't see. So <clears throat> um, coming back to the main points, then uh, we see uh, activity, tectonic activity, very recent and ongoing in the reef. Uh, this is expressed as widespread and normal faulting in the river profiles, in the tectonic nick points, and many other metrics that I'm not showing from the, from, uh, the fluvial topography and in uplift uh, shorelines in the quaternary. So maybe you are still skeptical because, uh, well, I've only shown a few examples in few areas, but uh, there are examples all over the reef and as far north as this southern plain. Um, which I'm not showing here, but it exists. Um, and the interesting part of this, of course, is that uh, this implies that it is not entirely tectonically quiet. The reef is uh, active still and is uh, faulting uh, extensionally. And this suggests that the, the tectonic plate boundary is still, is still evolving. And as to the why, well, be my guess, I don't really have an idea why, but out of the two possibilities that I think are more plausible, um, the one that is translation of far field stresses due to the alpha plume, uh, do not seem, uh, I'm not very comfortable with it because of the reason I just mentioned, because uh, the, the effects seem very related locally with the, the normal faulting and not as a regional si uh, signal. So I feel the more this change in the Eulerian pole of rotation between the African and Arabian plate that has been recently suggested by the IPGP group in France for the Akaba Gulf. And so what I suggest is that uh, we check all others fails and rifts and see if they are really, really fail or we just uh, thought of them like so. Thank you. Thanks a lot, David. Time for a few questions. Uh, may so, I take a question? Yes, go ahead. And beautiful presentation. I would like to know, there is some seismicity associated to it uh, in this area to these vertical movements you recorded by geomorphology. Is, is it, sorry, is it a question if there is or, or is there an yeah. affirmation? No, there is a seismicity associated to, you know, if there is. Yes, yes, no, no, I, I'm, I'm, of... oh, please, yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware, I'm aware. I just uh, left it out. Uh, for the presentation, but yeah, uh, yeah, and isn't it? Uh, if if you, I mean, we knew about the seismicity before, uh, so uh, how come no one wonder uh, about the activity of the rift? Uh, also, the GPS uh, seems to to indicate uh, this extension, uh, very lightly though. 
not it's not yeah same with the seismicity it's like uh, it's not very strong and it's very distributed but it's there right so yeah that would have been my question too why why do people think it's it's a dead rift in the first place um suzanne has a question thank you <laughs> why, why do why do they that's the question no, no, they just, Suzanne can ask her a question now. Ah, sorry. I've asked many. David, when, when you say the, um, the, the plate boundary is still evolving, um, do, do you also mean that there is extension invo involved or does it mean that you, you see vertical motions? Because th these, these are not necessarily the same thing, right? I mean, if you still have tectonic activity, in this case, it's drifting in the area, uh, I mean, if, if you, you could have, say, um, we see other margins, for example, the, the Norwegian margin, which is a full grown um, extension of plate boundary, right? But you see in areas, for example, in the north of Norway, um, active faulting structures. If you look at the, the topography, it looks alpine. I mean, this is active. But you know, the, the, the extension activity sits on the mid ocean ridge far out. Mm. So, um, and, and one of the, I mean, we don't really know why, why there's this high topography there. But you do have um, offset on your normal faults, but it does. One of the ideas it, it could be flexural loading, unloading, you know, what was also referred to by, by, by Roy as one of the mechanisms um, of the Transarctic Mountains. And so you have erosion offshore deposition, erosion onshore deposition offshore, which then can create offset on your normal fault. So the normal fault activity doesn't necessarily mean an extensional activity. Mm, I see what you mean. Uh, this, uh... Totally fair point. Um, yes, well, I guess uh, that's also a possibility. Um, there's a, a big package actually of sediments in the basin is being filled up. So, so yes, and that's a possibility. I haven't thought. Yeah, of. I think it would be really interesting to <laughs> this, you know, these ones that we, because I agree that not all field drifts are probably inactive, but as, as we see that many full grown plate margins are not inactive either. So it would be really interesting to-, to, to The, main, the main thing what I call for the, for, for the boundary being still active is uh, because in all those other areas that are still uplifting or maybe uplifting and extending, uh, you could call for, for small mantle cells, you have been uh, hypothesis in, in that regard, you have up, and you have funny uplifting passive margins in many places, right? Uh, that, that's supposed not to, to, to happen. Um, but you, you always have this, well, either powerful stresses or, or small cells uh, convection. And here I saw like, it doesn't seem uh, there's, there's no regional signal is very local. So then I that side of, uh, of, the, of the boundary. And I, I think, you know, it, it's always the question, are, are we seeing um, some a similar observation that, that could maybe be explained with, with similar mechanism or do we have different mechanisms <laughs> in each place? You know, it's somehow I, I tend to like less, but it's not said that there should be a common mechanism either. So yeah, thanks a lot. Well, thank you. One uh, quick last question by Adele Mustafa, and then uh, we'll finish for today. Uh, thank you for this uh, interesting talk. Uh, I uh, just wanted to ask, uh, do you see any relationship as was suggested by others before that the extension, especially in the southern part of the Suez Rift is related to the movement on the Dead, Dead Sea Transform? especially that the seismicity in that part of the rift uh, is much higher than the rest of the rift. Thank you. Well, that is obviously a very good question. <laughs> I'm somewhat honored to, to have a question from you. I've been enjoying your papers very much. Um, I would say this is what I mentioned uh, explicitly and several times that, that the, we see this activity far north in the rift like up to 200, 250 kilometers uh, north of the rift southern terminus, 
uh, I still see this uh, this topography creation and this uh, this uh, recent tectonic activity. So uh, that's why um, what really happens on the triple point. I, I didn't consider it all that relevant. You do have obviously more activity around there. You have the islands that have the, the marine terraces that you have much more seismicity in the southern terminus of, uh, of the rift. But uh, it's seeing this activity all the way up north, almost up to Suez, then I, I don't attribute it to the, to the triple point uh, per se. But you don't mean that the rift is, or rifting is going on. It's just reactivation of uh, parts of the rift due to the far field stresses from nearby plate boundaries. Do you agree with that? Um, it, that could be an explanation. Uh, I, um, I remain very laid back on the why this is happening now where I like the, uh, uh, your hypothesis, I like Susanne's uh, hypothesis. I like my own as well, uh, but I, I don't have an answer. I just know there's, there's activity happening here that we should look at more closely, I guess. Thank you. 